I think we're in the show. It says everyone. 10 seconds. Here we go. Yes. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Vinicius Nobre. You can call me Vinny. And this is Isabella Villas Boas. Isabella, please say hi, Isabella. Hi, everybody. I'm Isabella, and you can call me Isabella. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great to be here with you today. I'm speaking from Sao Paulo. Isabella is in Brasilia, and I'm sure that we are talking to people from all around Brazil. And as I can see, people from different countries as well. I see that there are people from Peru. So hi, Peru. Hi, and Peru. one of the reasons why we are doing this together, me and Isabella, it's because we wrote a book together and the book is called Getting Into ELT Assessment. I've got my copy here and it's already being sold by SPS. So if you enjoy the topic and if you want to know more about assessment after this talk, please make sure that you get in touch with SPS and get a copy of our book. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to use the chat to talk about this topic. I know that everyone is interested in the certificates, but we are not going to talk about certificates in this talk. We're going to talk about assessment. And if you need links from the other talks or anything else, uh, you can talk directly to SBS. The certificates are going to be sent to you on Monday, okay? So if we could focus on our interaction in the chat, and make sure that it revolves around assessment and the topic here. It, this will be very, very, very helpful. And Isabella and I will be able to uh, see the questions and interact with you. Do we have a deal, everyone? Is that okay? So no talk about certificates or links. You can write to SBS straight away. So Isabella, why don't you get the ball rolling and why don't you tell us and tell everybody else what is it that we're going to tackle today? Okay, right. Thank you, Vini. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with my dear friend, Vini. It's always wonderful to be able to talk to a community of educators together with, with my friend and colleague and co-author. Um, so, partner in crime, right, Vini? Yeah. So, um, so our purpose today is to talk about assessment literacy and what we feel teachers should know about assessment in order to, to be able to uh, be, let's say, full educators, because we can't, we can't even say assessment specialists, because what we believe is that an educator should know about assessment just as much as they know about methodology, about second language acquisition, if we're talking about um, language teachers, because assessment and, and teaching are directly related. You can't separate them. So it's really part of a, of a teacher's um, a group of, of, of knowledge, of competencies to know about assessment. So that's what we're going to do today. Uh, we picked from our, we have a big list of items that would constitute assessment literacy for teachers, but we picked only some because of the length of this session, and we're going to address them, but we would really like you to ask questions. So we will be monitoring um, the questions you ask and, and we'll try to answer them as, as much as possible, okay? So, so let's get started, Isabella. Yes. Let's get sure. our first statement about um, uh, assessment literacy. Right. So we believe that teachers who are assessment literate, first and foremost, have to be able to differentiate assessment from testing. Now, this, this may seem very simple and very easy, but sometimes it's very hard to really incorporate it into your mental model in a way that this is clear in everything you do and you say. I'm going to give you an example of how this can sometimes be tricky, right? I was interacting with a, with a colleague who's highly qualified, who is assessment literate in my point of view and has dealt with, the, with assessment for many years. And we were talking about students who audit our classes due to uh, learning differences that they have and that you know they have accommodations, et cetera. And then when we were talking about this, I, uh, we said, no, these students don't receive grades. Uh, they just, they, 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 they audit the course and they don't receive the same report card with grades, et cetera, as the other students do. And then she inadvertently said, oh, so they're not assessed. And I went, mm -hmm. 
how come they're not assessed, right? Of course they're assessed. They don't get a grade. They don't get a report card with a numerical grade, but they get feedback all the time informally and formally. So of course they are assessed. But as you can see, it's hard to differentiate sometimes assessment from testing, from grading, from our traditional instruments, right? But of course they are assessed. Of course they receive feedback. We assess people all the time, whether we know it or not. Vini, do you have anything to add about that? Absolutely. Uh, I think, as Isabella mentioned, one of the biggest challenges that we face when talking about assessment is all the preconceived ideas that uh, we, we as a society, not necessarily we as educators, but we as a society have regarding assessment. So I ask everyone who's, who's watching us, and if you could uh, let us know in the chat, have you ever worked somewhere that assessed students in alternative ways without using formal tests. How important are formal tests in your context? Because uh, in our experience, I mean, Isabel and I talked a lot uh, about assessment while writing the book. Uh, in our experience, most contexts still rely very much on the tests to assess students. And many times other strategies that are used in the process of uh, assessment are sometimes undervalued, underrated, they are not taken as seriously. So it's very important for us as course designers, coordinators, classroom teachers, parents, and even students, because uh, I know that we are teachers, but when we're wearing a different hat and then we become students, sometimes we forget some of the things that we know. And I, I've had a lot of teachers uh, asking for a formal test after a course because they they challenged the kind of assessment that was being carried out. So I would love for you to just share in the in the chat if uh, tests are really uh, important and are considered to be the only possible way to assess. Uh, so our first uh, suggestion here for those who who are interested in assessment is to really understand the difference between assessing learning and uh, assessing the learners and assessing the learning process and using assessment as part of learning and testing. Testing is a, a one of the possible subsets of assessment, but definitely not the only one. Right, right. Bella. I'm following here the, the chat. Some people, not most of them, few people have um, work in institutions where tests are not used at all used at all most of them are um, are mentioning that in their context both uh, tests and other types of assessments are used um, uh, 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 somebody's talking about uh, elk house is saying that tests are important because uh, that that's what uh, people Formal tests are important because students will have a professional life later and they will need to know how to be formal in their day to day, et cetera. And um, I'd like to point out that um, we are not disregarding tests, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, we have a whole chapter in our book about how to design tests. So we, we are not considering that people will not administer tests, etc. But what we propose is uh, uh, an assessment system that encompasses uh, preferably not only tests, but other more authentic ways of assessment. Right, Vini? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. We, we understand the, the, that tests play an important role. Uh, and we even talk about ways to design effective written tests or uh, tests to, to assess speaking. So that's something you can also find in the book. But I, I believe that the real um, message that we want to convey is that uh, maybe we need to look at assessment as a more global thing a little bit more, right? The tendency is still to focus a lot on only the, the written tests in many contexts. And I, I can see in the chat that uh, a lot of you have uh, very rich experiences in terms of assessment, like uh, using alternative ways and combining things. This is this is great. And we've got another statement uh, that we develop in the book, which is uh, teachers who are assessment literate can differentiate formative and summative assessments and can use them for their intended purpose at the right time. Isabella, can you, uh, would you like to 
start expanding a little bit on this? Right. Yes. Um, yes. I think this this difference between formative and summative is is extremely important, and sometimes it is confused in 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 some contexts. Right. Um, so formative assessment is assessment for learning, or even better, as learning. It's a it's a variation. It's the newest variation of formative assessment. Right. And summative assessment is assessment of learning. It's assessment that takes stock of what has been learned in order to give feedback to stakeholders, in order to make decisions about whether students should be promoted to another level or another school year, or whether they pass, or whether they should get a job or um, take a position in a, in a, in a program, etc. cetera. So uh, uh, that's summative, right? In terms of learning in a learning situation, to take stock of what students have learned, whereas formative assessment is the assessment that will inform the teacher of what has been learned and what needs to be worked on. So formative assessment will always involve going back to what has not been to the uh, learning outcomes that have not been reached and working towards uh, towards these objectives so that students reach them. So um, so formative assessment will always involve some some kind of redoing, retaking, reformulating, going back, reteaching, etc. Right. So um, Bini says something that I really like about formative assessment that people sometimes think that uh, administering um, assessments uh, more frequently means doing formative assessment. But this is not true because if you administer the assessment is not, and nothing is done about it, it's just set in stone, that's the grade the student got and that's it, it's summative anyway. So uh, formative and summative have nothing to do with frequency and neither do they have anything to do with the instrument itself. A test can be used formatively and uh, a project can be used summatively if, if there is no feedback along the way and there is no feedback that will result in redoing, reanalyzing, having another chance, right? Absolutely. To add, Penny. I know, I think that you, you raised such an important issue, Isabella, when it comes to uh, the, the, the misconception. And sometimes it comes from a very good intention, right? We, we understand the importance of formative assessment and we want to implement it, but many times we stumble a little bit while doing it. And we assume that just because we have a lot of tests or uh, because we have frequent moments of assessment or maybe a different tool like a project, it can already be considered formative. But I ask all of you out there, how much of your teaching changes after this assessment? I think this is the key question, because if you have a, a very prescriptive way to teach, or if you have planned all the lessons of the semester and you don't change anything while doing, carrying out formative assessment, then, the, the assessment that is happening is more summative than formative. Uh, even if it happens every day, uh, what you're doing, you're checking what students know, but this is not informing your practice. So uh, in my, my experience working in different places, I have you know, learned that a, a lot of times we want to be more formative, but uh, the teaching is so um stuck in its own ways right what we do is so fixed either because of the course book or because of the lesson plans or because of the the methodology of the school that the lessons end up being pretty much the same whether students were assessed in a way or in a different way so um just try to remember formative assessment impacts the teaching what happens after the assessment will naturally change because of the information that you gathered it's a much more positive perspective towards assessment because we're not just checking what people learned but we're helping them become better in whatever it is that we're we're, we're dealing with so uh, the aim is to uh, empower people and not just uh, rank them or look back right does that make sense Isabella my yeah co and I, I'd also like to point out something about this because uh, and this is a personal interpretation okay because I see uh, some many people relating formative assessment to not assigning a grade 
um, in places where grades are assigned and the grades are only assigned for summative assessment. I don't really agree with this with this definition because I think you can have form you can have graded formative assessments as well. As long as the students get feedback, they have a chance to relearn and this is redone. The students retake the assessment to improve uh, their grades because their grades should be nothing less than a, a reflection of the learning and of the learning only. In fact, right, uh, not a reflection of whether they've turned in their work on time or whether they're they've uh, attended all the classes or whether they behave well in class. Uh, the the if you're talking about learning outcomes, you should be able to um, report on whether students have reached the outcome, um, thinking only about the, the outcome and not involving non-cognitive elements in, in, in this grading system. So you can, you can have grades with formative assessment, but as long as there is this opportunity to go back and redo, 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 kind of related, connected to mastery learning, right? You do it again and again until the students reach a minimum criteria that is never 50%. It's always much higher than that. Does that make sense, Vini? Absolutely. And it does, at the end of the day, reflect a little bit uh, how we perceive learning, right? Uh, and education as something positive and, and not something that is there to punish students, but rather we want the students to achieve more. And our role is not to label students, but to help them get there. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of formative assessment right now during our talk because your interaction in the chat is providing us with information about the talk and I'm going to change a little bit what I was going to say based on what uh, you have written. So this is an example of how I am formatively assessing the information that is getting to me. There are two things that I wanted to say that uh, I hadn't planned. The first one is the certificates will be given to you, will be sent to you on Monday. And we really want the chat to be used for the topic that we are discussing because it makes our lives much, much easier. So if you could please focus on the theme of the talk and direct other questions to SPS, uh, this will help us tremendously. And one of the questions that, or the, the, the points actually that was raised uh, related to the pandemic. And I think that this is a very interesting moment because uh, a, a lot of schools and a lot of teachers uh, felt very, lost and a little bit confused regarding what they could do uh, under the present circumstances because students were at home how would they be able to assess the students and this comes to show that we still think a lot about summative assessment at the end of the day because their concern was not how they would be able to formatively assess how students were doing to adapt the, the resources, to adapt the tools, to adapt the content, the style of teaching. They were more concerned about what the students had learned full stop. Uh, and this is something interesting because sometimes we're not even aware of how summative we are. Uh, and uh, the, the current moment, if you are assessing students formatively, the current moment would be a very interesting uh, period for you to, to uh, experiment more with formative assessment to change what you're doing in class. Do you agree, Isabella? Yes, of course. Yes. And and, and uh, tests are one. Uh, I mean, assessment, the term assessment is much wider than than the term test. Right. A test is one one way, one one approach to assessing w within a big umbrella of other ways to assess. Right. And during the pandemic, uh, I believe people had the chance to um, especially due to the restrictions of uh, doing the traditional tests with the same kinds of uh, uh, control mechanisms, uh, if I may say, et cetera, led people to really rethink, right? So people were asking, um, I, I, um, in one of the talks I gave, people were concerned about, but how do I, how do I give my tests uh, remotely? How do I control whether students are cheating or mm -hmm. copying or et cetera? And I said, you know what? I think this is a time to do away with any of this idea of tests and controlling and, and um, distrust, etc., and give students an opportunity to do something more authentic. Now, if you are going to do tests remotely and we're not um, 
trying to be discriminatory, right? And saying that, oh, if you use tests, it's terrible. You can still use tests, but you have to construct the test taking this new con context into consideration. So make the test, write your test so that, so that you will know that there will be consultation, like a take-home exam. The students can consult, the students can check in their books, but what they produce will be something creative and something of much more that involves much more critical thinking than just um, a, a, a rote learning, let's say, right? So yeah. even if you are going to use tests, which is fine, you have to change your perspective and you have to change the way you see these tests. Yeah, and this could be, uh, I think, the whole uh, idea of cheating and why is it that students cheat and why is it that we're so concerned about the cheating? Uh, this could be another talk of its own, right? Because it has a lot to do with uh, the purpose behind the, the assessment tool and what we are looking for exactly. Are we doing this to help learners or uh, do, do students perceive that moment as a relevant opportunity to to check how much they they learn or is that just a reward that students uh get because they've memorized things and they, they love they've learned things by heart for example so this i think that there's so much to say about cheating and the motivation behind taking tests and being assessed and understanding why it's part of the educational process but this could be another talk but i'd like to move on yes. to assessment purposes and instruments, um, considering the different skills and the different systems. This is very language related. It is about uh, how we assess language learners, right? So uh, Isabella, why does a teacher need to identify this range of assessment purposes and instruments? Can maybe you, maybe, can you give us an example or something? Right, right. Because uh, as, as um, some people were mentioning here in the chat, right, it's all about the purpose, right? It's all about the intention and, and also about the construct that you are assessing. So you have to, uh, an assessment literate teacher has to be able to match the instrument to the purpose, to the goal of the program, to the kind of competences that, that they want to develop. So if you want students, for example, to be able to be producers of the language, uh, autonomous producers of the language, you really have to go beyond uh, um, kinds of uh, writing tests, for example, that do not give students the opportunity to really produce the language. That will only require filling in blanks or ticking boxes because this is not um, a, a factor. But if you're teaching a prep course, for example, you're teaching a prep course for a name. So you should use instruments that fit the purpose. The students are taking a prep course for a name. This is what a name looks like and I'm training them to do well on this test. This is fine because this is your purpose. So we have nothing against that. What we do not agree is when you say that you're teaching a communicative curriculum and you assess students in non-communicative ways, then there's a mismatch between your assessment purpose uh, and, your, and the instruments you're using. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, what, what I always find uh, very challenging is uh, when we, we are faced with institutions or, or teachers um, who, who are trying to implement more modern, let's say, more current pedagogies like uh, active learning and project-based learning, and they want to foster critical thinking and they want to develop digital literacy. Um, but then when students have to to be assessed, they are given a written test that is a multiple choice test. Uh, if you want to assess whether students are thinking critically and if you want to assess whether your goals are being achieved in preparing students to be digital, digitally literate and the assessment instrument needs to be completely aligned with what you're doing. So uh, it, it's sometimes a bit frustrating to, to see uh, very good intentions uh, of, of academic programs and syllabi that try to revolve a little bit more around uh, soft skills and other competencies. But then at the end of the day, these goals are not truly being assessed. And then we have uh, what we call a washback effect that is uh, a concept that you're going to find in our book, Bling Bling, Marketing Moments. <laughs> 
And the washback effect, which is the effect that the, the assessment tool has uh, in the teaching, is very negative because teachers will naturally prepare students for that test, the multiple choice test. And they will end up forgetting or not focusing so much on the other skills that allegedly um, are underlying principles of the whole academic uh, program. So the, the purpose of your assessment and the instruments that you use may have to be very much aligned with the skills and the systems that you intend to foster, but also the, um, the, the, the pedagogical principles and the uh, ultimate goals of the learning experience, right? Right. Uh, one, um, um, there's an, a comment here that I found very interesting and it's very true. Um, Melina is saying that um, she's working with Zoom during the pandemic and uh, it's hard for her to, because they're talking and the, they're chatting about um, ongoing assessment of student performance during the classes, right? Uh, getting data about students' performance. And with Zoom, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge. And I agree with you, Melina, because some students are very intimidated. They don't want to turn on their cameras. It can be for many reasons. Um, and some of them, be, maybe because they're too shy or they don't want to show uh, their 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 rooms or their houses or there's so many factors involved in this, right? So it's true that during this period when you're teaching um, using uh, uh, an online tool for, for live teaching, this can be a little more challenging. But I think that this can be kind of overcome if you were, if you use more the break, the breakout rooms technique and you visit the rooms and you have the students, you chat with the students each time, you know, with, with smaller numbers of students, even if their cameras are off, but you can hear them. They do feel more comfortable when they are with a smaller group, especially when they're um, with uh, with with their friends, but but this ongoing assessment is one more. It's very important, and it's one more instrument that that can be used to assess students. Right? Uh, what we really uh, advocate is the use of a, a variety of instruments, so that you can. It's like in a research project, right? Don't we use a variety of instruments to triangulate data? So in, 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 in an in assessment system, we should use a variety of tools to get a full picture of what students can do and in what context they can do this, right? If they can do this in an unplanned situation, if they can do it in a planned situation, etc. But what I really recommend for this period, Melina, is something I read in one of the educational leadership issues on assessment. It talks about, you know, in these uh, exceptional times, we really have to consider do no harm assessment. I really like this expression. So um, because people are facing a number of contextual factors that are affecting the way they participate in interactions, that are affecting their education, they can have, they can have sick people in their families, they may have lost a dear person, they may be facing financial difficulties with their families, they may Lack be facing resources. anxiety and have, you know, and have uh, uh, pimples and they don't want to show their faces or their hair doesn't look nice because they haven't been getting a haircut. Anyway, so there's so many things that we really have to be sensitive to, to, to the context. So assessment has to be context sensitive all the time. And uh, we, we're talking a lot about this uh, idea that we need to get to know the learners. And uh, Tania Cristina Fonseca asked a very interesting question. Uh, Tania asked, how can we help teachers who have to work in several schools who have more than 500 students and then they don't really have time uh, to stop and, and give assessment this much attention? Uh, I, I, I don't know if Isabella will necessarily agree with me, but Tania, I, I totally get you, and I'm not going to say that it's easy. I think that the more students you have, the harder it is for you to uh, assess, especially formatively. It's much easier for you to have a standardized test that is extremely objective, easy to mark, and then you know get the results and the information from a, a more summative uh, tool that is you know very straightforward. Uh, however, there are little things that you can try and do. Um, 
getting you know, Isabella's example, uh, Isabella just ex exemplified how you can um, follow students more privately using uh, the, the technology that we have today going to their breakout rooms. If you are teaching face-to-face, -face, you can try to focus on specific groups of students during class and keep uh, a register, some, some kind of, of control of uh, what students are producing, what their difficulties are, how well they are coping with the learning. And then, you know, uh, keep uh, by keeping this record, you can create kind of like uh, their history in the in the process. And then two, three lessons later, you sit down with the same group. The more students are uh, active in the process, the more you can see them in action, the easier it is for you to withdraw and just become an observer. If you have to provide students with a lot of input and lecture, it, it does become harder for you to assess how well they are doing and what they might need help with. So if you can get these learners, all the 500 learners that you have to do as much as possible in class and then become an observer, you can maybe try to keep uh, daily records of different groups of students while they are working that will then inform your practice and will give you an idea of, of how well they are doing. Do, do you have anything to add, Isabella? Well, Ruth is talking about portfolios. Portfolios are my dream, my nirvana type of assessment because but but when i talk about portfolio i'm, I'm really talking about real portfolio assessment not a folder where where students put all the work they have done portfolio assessment is much more than that portfolio assessment has to do with uh it has to have choice it has to have reflection and it has to have evidence of uh learning so students purposefully choose the artifacts that they have produced that will show the, 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 the audience what they have learned, how they have learned it, and their reflection upon their learning. This for me is the ideal way of assessing students. However, I do understand that in our context with so many students, with teachers who have so many students, it is easier, it's, um, easier said than done, right? Because it's very hard for teachers to, to handle this. Um, it's also very hard for teachers to, um, to handle, for example, in that situation with 500 students, performance assessments, right? How are you going to watch 500 videos or read multiple drafts of 500 pieces of writing and give feedback and opportunities to retake over and over again? My advice for this kind of situation is peer feedback. So have your students give feedback to each other. You're not the only person who is responsible for providing feedback. So give your students guidelines, teach them how to give feedback to each other, Get, use samples. It's a, it's, a, it's a slow process. You really have to teach them the language of feedback, um, how to give feedback. But after you do it, we, with a large group of students, this is a very good way to work with performance assessment in a way that students give, give feedback to each other during the process, they, re they redo their work, right? And then you only, you, 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 when you are the one to give feedback, it's, it's much easier for you because they have already improved based on their peers. And they improve not only by receiving feedback, but especially by giving feedback because they see what another student has done with the same task and by doing this, they can see their own task better. Absolutely. I, I'd just like to highlight how fascinating the chat is. There are so many interesting comments and yes. so many uh, fascinating questions and experiences. Uh, this is this is really, really rich. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much for focusing on the topic and producing uh, such amazing amazing input for us uh, since we are talking about feedback isabella mentioned now peer feedback and we understand the power of feedback there is also another type of feedback that the the teacher who's assessment literate should be 
uh, should feel empowered to, to provide, which is uh, feedback on the instruments that were not necessarily designed by them. And uh, by doing this, refer to the accurate terminology by saying uh, things related to the validity, the reliability, the objectivity, the washback effect, if it's norm referenced, if it's criterion based, and, uh, if it's, um, there's there are so many uh, specific terms behind assessment. Uh, why do, do you think, Isabella, I mean, with all your experience, I mean, I, I know because we talked about this, but why don't you tell everybody why you think that the teacher who is assessment literate uh, should be empowered to provide feedback on the instrument? Right, because sometimes you may work in an institution where you don't design all the instruments, but you have to give feedback on the instruments that were designed. And I think this is uh, very important for, for teachers to to have a voice and to provide feedback. And some people may say, oh, but why do we have to know terminology? If we say it in a more general way, won't it be the same? Well, I believe that language is power and knowledge is power. So when we're able to give feedback using the right terminology, using, I'm not saying that you should regurgitate uh, research and author names, nothing like that, but when you're, when you're able, it's about genre, right? So when you're able to use this academic genre to talk to a colleague and give feedback on assessment at the same level, you can be more convincing and then you have more power. I really think that language and knowledge are, pow are, are powerful. And if we can use them to the benefit of our students, because they are the ones we should have in mind all the time, the better, right? I'll give you a simple example, everyone out there. Uh, actually, before I give the example, let me just pose the question and then you can tell me. How many of you can design your assessment tools, whether it's a written test or portfolio or um, a project or a presentation, whatever it is, how many of you have full autonomy to decide on the instruments that you're going to use and how many of you have to follow either a set of guidelines or use exactly the instruments that are given to you, right? So if you could uh, share this while I, I explain a little bit some of my experience with that. Um, if you can't, if you are in this context that uh, Isabella was uh, illustrating now and you work in an institution and you receive the assessment tools and sometimes you receive the written test that you have to use uh, an interesting analysis that i'm going to to share with you is whether that test or whether that assessment truly reflects what the school intends to uh, teach and what the school intends to be let me give you an example if you work in an institution that says that they are very communicative, that they focus on the communicative approach, for example, uh, and uh, all the language is contextualized and students have the opportunity to interact, one thing that you might want to uh, discuss with the decision makers in your school and one thing that uh, you can definitely make a huge contribution about is whether a written test that is multiple choice with isolated sentences, fill in the blank with the correct preposition, truly reflects the uh, uh, intention of the academic program. Because if you are focusing on speaking skills, interaction, com uh, communicative approach, and then you ask students to show how much they know about the language and how much they know about the rules of certain grammar patterns that are not really contextualized, that are not really um, uh, real life, then you have a, 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 a mismatch there that you might be able to raise awareness of. And, and if you are well informed and you know the genre, uh, you can provide your school with this feedback and maybe help them redesign the instruments that are being used for, for assessment. Um, does that make sense, Isabella, you think? Yes, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm following here the, the responses. We have a mixed audience. We have people who have full autonomy. We have people who have some percentage of autonomy and people who have very little autonomy. So uh, it's very interesting, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so can we go on to the next one? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, because I'm keeping track of time and we only have 10 more minutes, Vinny. Um, so um, design both traditional and alternative assessment instruments for skills and systems that are authentic, valid, reliable, fair, and equitable and that will result in a positive washback effect on teaching and learning. There's a lot here to unpack, right? Um, I would really like to emphasize positive washback. What Vini and I, uh, our main purpose, and we say that in our book that somebody even asked what the name is, it's the same name as this session, Getting Into ELT Assessment, okay, uh, by uh, Sam Gage, and it's being sold at SBS. Um, so what we really our dream is that by that we can we we hope with our book and our discussions and the talks we have been giving that we will impact teachers in such a way that they will impact their students as a result in the sense of making them have positive memories about the way they were assessed. Because our generation has very negative memories about the way we were assessed. So our dream is that we will really reimagine assessment in a way that it will be so intricately related to learning and it will become um, a friend of the students and not an enemy, that they will have positive uh, memories about the way they were assessed, the feedback that they, that they got from their teachers, and the way this feedback was used, and the way that assessment and testing and grades were not used as behavior control mechanisms, as uh, ways to threaten students, to show teacher power, as we have experienced in, at least I have, and I think Vini has too, in our, um, in our learning when we were students. Right. So we want teachers to be able to design both traditional. We're not saying the traditional assessment is going to go away. We, 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 as I said, we have a chapter on this, but we can do, we can design better traditional instruments, I believe. Right. And especially alternative instruments, um, considering the skills that they are assessing, listening, speaking, reading, writing, and systems also. Right and authentic, valid, reliable, but really with a positive washback. Vini, what, what about uh, you? I, I, I think that, as you mentioned, that this statement, it unfolds into so many different things. And I want to uh, address Juliana Paupino Araujo Rodrigues' question, which is, uh, is the information in our book and somebody asked for the name of the book, Getting into ELT Assessment, uh, if it's relevant for teachers at public schools. Uh, Juliana, we really think so. And we think that, uh, as Isabella mentioned before, the more you know, uh, the, the easier it is for you to assess what is happening. So even if you have, uh, let's say, limited power in terms of the decisions that you're going to make, uh, you can still maybe design alternative forms of assessment, informal ways of assessment, or maybe even have the ultimate goal to, to turn the learning experience to your students into something more positive and maybe help them look at assessment and testing in a different way. And then, you know, all the theory that comes behind uh, assessment will definitely help you and empower you. So the, the more we know about how people are assessed traditionally, what is the, what is the history behind assessment? Uh, how have we been dealing with assessment and testing? And what do we need to change? Uh, if you ask me, and um, I know Isabella is not as passionate about it as I am, but if you ask me, my dream would be for, for us to get rid of all the formal written tests. Uh, if, if, if you ask me, Vinny, if you wanted to change something in the educational system, I would say get rid of the tests. Me, me too. <laughs> there we go. However, uh, however, there is a, a little however. more realistic than Vini, you know. <laughs> not we. I'm not saying he's not realistic. It's that he's a. <laughs> I'm less of a dreamer than Vini is. I think. Um, we we it's it's 
due to the characteristics of our educational system and the lack of opportunities for everyone to get into university or et cetera, and there needs to be some kind of selection, it's still going to be, it, we're still going to have to live with standardized high stakes assessments for a long time, unfortunately. Absolutely. No, I couldn't yeah. agree more. I yeah. think that's the US is already moving away from it in mm -hmm. the sense that many universities are doing away with SAT and ACT. They're not requiring these exams anymore. That's quite bold of them. I don't see this happening uh, anytime soon in Brazil. So we also talk about these kinds of assessments. So we try to be very practical. We provide the basic knowledge on terminology. We provide information that we know teachers should, should know about standardized tests and what their purposes are, at what stage they should be recommended to students, etc. We help teachers who work in places where tests are, um, are used to design better tests. And then we move to, you know, some kind of proposals for the future. And this has to be done, even if you decide to change your assessment system, this has to be done in a very careful and planned way. You can't just rock the bolt and change everything from, you know, from totally traditional to totally alternative. You have to take small steps each time until you reach your goal because you have stakeholders that you have to convince. That's yeah, that's one thing that I was going to add. We, we can't ignore the other stakeholders. We can't ignore the fact that we still have the students' expectations and the families' expectations. So as I said, it's a big, big, big dream that I have. And I'll try to fight a little bit to make it happen. There are some amazing comments in the chat and some very interesting uh, ideas, um, but there is one question in particular that I'd like to uh, address. Erika Maria Rocha Leite is asking about homework and the relationship with assessment. And Erika, this is a very interesting question because I don't think that we use homework, and this is my opinion, okay? I don't think we use homework, um, uh, uh, we, we don't take full advantage of homework. We don't use it as an assessment tool as much as it could be. We usually assign students homework, kind of like pro forma. We know that they are copying from each other or copying from the answer key or doing it five minutes before the lesson and we don't have time to check homework if large group students are not really looking to everyone work if we designed homework that is meaningful and then i'm going to to use the same terminology here <laughs> if we use homework that is authentic valid reliable fair and equitable then uh, we are maybe uh, looking at an amazing assessment tool that can also help learners engage with the, the learning process and with the language outside the classroom. So I think that we need to, it's another talk for sure, but since you raised the question, uh, I'll, I'll say that I think it's a great uh, possibility that we usually ignore or maybe underestimate. We have three minutes, Isabella. Any for our last remarks? slide. <laughs> uh, do you think we should go to, to the next slide or maybe just wrap up? I think we, I, I, I would like to show the last slide because I think sure. for me, it's the ultimate goal of an assessment literate teach. No, no, the, the, the last, the very last one. Mm, okay. This one. And the, okay, the, the very last, because we have, oh, we have a lot of, um, this is the last uh, one, right? No, this okay. is the last one, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, okay, we, I talked about accountability assessment. That's right. That's right. Uh, so you can go back to the previous one. Sorry, folks, we talked too much. So we ended up not being able to discuss, but we did discuss all of them indirectly, right? Yes. And they're, and they're all, all in the book. They're all in the book and there are more. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, I think we teachers are student advocates. So we have to think about assessment in the interest of our students. So that's why we have to be assessment literate. We have to be assessment literate so that we can advocate 
um, in favor of our students and their rights and equity, but with rigor, okay? We're not talking about everything goes, let's lower the standards, that's not it. But let's give students as many chances as possible to show the best that they can do and not the minimum, as is the rule in assessment, in traditional assessment in our uh, society. I think that's, you know, in the end, there is a very interesting question. Somebody asked what planet we come from. I have absolutely no idea what they meant by that. Um, if they think that uh, we are detached from reality or, no, but we come from I a planet. I a big school with, with, <laughs> with thousands of students and hundreds of teachers and many things are pretty much standardized, but we have been able to shift with the help of the of our brilliant teachers from a more uh, traditional to a formative assessment system, but very slowly and responsibly because there are many people involved. Yeah, well, I was going to say we come we come from a planet of, uh, you know, a lot of hard work and ideals and uh, the, the willingness to make a difference. I think this is the world we come from. And uh, we believe that uh, by, by knowing more about our practice and by knowing more about the different elements that are involved in education, we can start changing things. But we need to know, we need to know about it and we need to, to hope, we can't lose hope. Um, so my final remarks before I ask Isabella to, to close the session today is thank you very, very much. I'm Vinny underscore Nobre in Instagram. So follow me there. I'll be very happy to maintain this conversation with you. And follow Troika as well. If you're not a Troika member, take a look into our website and our community is an amazing community. We have all these conversations there. And uh, by the book, by getting into EOT assessment. Uh, I think Susan Holden also mentioned um, another book that I, that I co-authored with her this morning. Uh, so please get, get all the books, all my books. I'll be very happy. Isabella, please wrap up. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. I really appreciated reading all your comments and, and thank you for, for the positive comments. It makes us very happy to, to know that we are in the right direction we're, and we're contributing somehow to, to hope and to um, empathy and, and everything that you mentioned. Uh, uh, please also follow me on Instagram. Instagram. I'm at Isabella VB, but if you look up Isabella Villas Bulls, you also find me. Also follow Casa Thomas Jefferson. We have lots of opportunities for teacher development as well. So uh, please uh, um, follow us and follow our uh, programs. We have a, a number of, of talks sponsored by the American Embassy on Education that are going to be held um, from now, Vini has been one of the speakers uh, and that will be held from now towards the end of the year. So please take, uh, they're free and they're, um, the more people, the better. And so please take this opportunity. Thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, National Geographic for Engage for giving us, trusting us, right? And publishing our book. Um, I'd also like to thank SBS for inviting us for this session, giving us the, the opportunity to share with this wonderful group of educators. So yes, thank you everyone. Thanks Engage, thanks SBS. Thank you everybody out there. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you so much and have a good event. Enjoy. Yeah.